Good evening. I had hoped the uh, cold front had, would come through before church started, but we didn't, we didn't luck out on that yet. So this might be our last uh, Wednesday evening to bake, and then we will chill in the future. All right. Um, as we've been doing, actually, what we're going to do for the next few weeks is continue to hear the previous Sunday's um, lections for the other lectionary. So you'll, if you're here on Sunday, you hear the, the one-year series. If you're here on Wednesday, you hear the three-year series. And some of that is a little bit repetitive to what we've already heard this summer, um, but I'll try to bring new insight for you tonight. All right. Our order of service will follow Divine Service Setting 3. That's on page 100. 84, and I encourage you to stand for confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment, but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turn to the insert. And we'll speak our intro it this evening. Let's speak it whole verse by whole verse. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Continue by speaking the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, 
have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Grant us courage to take up our cross daily and follow him wherever he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 15. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they, will, they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you, and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, we turn to the insert and we pray the Psalm, Psalm 26, whole verse by whole verse. Vindicate me, O Lord, For I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Epistles from Romans, chapter 12. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 
Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Be patient, or be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess together by the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty,
You may be seated. We sing the hymn of the day. Hail, thou once despised Jesus, hymn 531. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. It's probably one of the, well, I don't know, least under, well understood, but certainly misunderstood passages of Scripture. What does Jesus mean by taking up your cross and follow, following him? And maybe we can learn something of this if we first consider what Jesus himself did. 
and also the account of, well, Peter's unfortunate words to which Jesus received, uh, gave Peter a great rebuke. It began our gospel text today this way. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Now, normally, Jerusalem is the place you go up to on uh, feast days and in times of need, in times of need of forgiveness, to offer the sacrifices that God had appointed and to receive the proclamation of forgiveness of sins, the promise attached to those sacrifices. You would go up on the various feast days with the appointed sacrifice, and God would forgive you. So was to go to Jerusalem was to go and receive the gifts of promise. No different than you going up, well, to Sherman Center to have your sins forgiven, attached to the promises of your baptism, the word of absolution, and the supper. But when Jesus says, and he begins to show them that he must go to Jerusalem, he doesn't have that in mind. Jerusalem is for Jesus the place where the prophets are killed. Berechiah, the son of, or Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, was sacrificed before the altar. Jeremiah was thrown into the pit, ultimately lost his life in Jerusalem too. Jesus is going to Jerusalem not to have the accusation of the law of his sins forgiven as we would, but rather to have that law applied to him, to suffer in Jerusalem. Of course, what is the meaning of suffering? And that's part of the problem with bearing one's cross, is that we don't really understand what suffering is either. Usually in the church, we make light of the real sufferings that we experience. Somebody says that they um, have been diagnosed with cancer or they need surgery, and we say, we'll pray for you. Now, we, I'm not saying we don't mean it, but we can't really suffer with them. They will suffer for sure, physical ailment, or loss of job, or uh, of livelihood, or of a home, or some other kind of loss. That is ultimately suffering as well. But is that what Jesus means by bearing one's cross, to suffer the loss of things? I don't think so. So in the church, we had to come up, well, with an answer. What does it mean to take up one's cross? What does it mean to suffer? And usually it's talked about in the church as a whole list of spiritual disciplines, most of these being self-denial. We hear about these especially during the season of Lent, right? What are you giving up for Lent? And broadly speaking, the self-denial and the suffering that results are the things of the flesh. Uh, maybe three broad categories, food, sex, and sleep. And so, especially amongst the monks in days of old, and even now amongst pious Christians, we suffer during these penitential seasons with fasting, abstinence from food, abstinence from sex, and praying at all hours, and even in the middle of the night. But I don't think that's what Jesus means by suffering or taking up one's cross, these self-imposed disciplines. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with them to discipline one's body. Paul talks about that as if running a race. But to take up your cross and follow me does not mean that you get to invent or manufacture your kind of suffering in order to fulfill Jesus' command here to take up a cross. Again, we can understand what Jesus is talking about if we look to see what it means for him to take up his cross. So when Jesus speaks of suffering, he's not talking about abstaining from the desires of the flesh. If anyone taught that, it was his forerunner, John the Baptist, who himself didn't cut his hair and ate a diet of locusts and wild honey and wore uncomfortable clothing. On the other hand, Jesus doesn't seem to abstain from these things at all. He's eating and drinking all the time, it seems. He's even accused of being a glutton and a wine bibber, as they used to say. Suffering for Jesus means this. Jesus links his suffering to the suffering servant songs of Isaiah. 
specifically Isaiah, the end of chapter 52, and especially chapter 53. Those words that we hear every Good Friday, when we learn exactly what it means to take up one's cross. The suffering servant Jesus takes on, as he goes into Jerusalem, the iniquity of us all. To suffer, to bear one's cross, is to bear the sins of the world. That's what it meant for Jesus. But you'll note that in the gospel text today, neither Peter, and ultimately not Satan either, wants a Messiah who takes on the sins of the world, dies the death they deserve, and then forgives it. Neither Peter nor Satan wants a Messiah who forgives sins. That's a scandal and a stumbling block. Rather, they would rather have a sort of Messiah that tells you what to do and says, follow me, do all the things I tell you to. A law Messiah. Peter keeps tripping over this because the suffering servant doesn't die for Israel alone, which would be what the law would demand. But instead, Jesus has repeatedly shown in his ministry, those who he has cared for and spoken to, that his Messiahship is for Jew and Gentile, indeed for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus reveals that was always the will of God, Jew first and then Gentile, to suffer the sins of the people, to die their death, and to forgive them that they would have life and life everlasting. That was always the will of God, and Isaiah chapter 53, go read it, written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, confesses it. Luther even says that that's the gospel, the gospel written by the fifth evangelist, the prophet Isaiah. That's because well, the scriptures are clear. The law cannot save and it cannot redeem. But Israel and Peter, and ultimately Satan, thought it could. Peter doesn't ever really seem to get over this. Even after Jesus' ascension, you'll remember it's still a point of contention uh, with Paul at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. But when Jesus is resurrected, you'll note that he's resurrected without the law without sins, without death. Yours and everyone's sins, therefore, are forgiven. It's really impossible to believe, and Peter can't believe that, at least not yet. The Messiah does come to do the law, but ultimately to fulfill it once and for all. So Jesus, or so Peter then rebukes Jesus and actually tells him, forbids him, from being the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53. And that's what the law always does. It rebukes, it corrects, it disciplines, it condemns. But here, Peter has the audacity to turn Jesus' own law against himself. And who else twists God's word and tries to use it against God? Satan, the deceiver, dared to do so with Jesus in the wilderness temptations. And that's why Jesus then uses the binding key against Peter and Satan. That rebuke from Peter is not from the Holy Spirit, but rather from the evil spirit. Just in the few verses before our gospel text, Peter was an instrument of the Holy Spirit and confessed Christ to be the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, that confession of faith. And now, just a few moments later, Peter becomes an instrument of the devil and rebukes the Lord from doing his Messiah job. What's interesting, then, is to note how Peter really can't do anything about what he has said because neither word actually came from him. First, he spoke by the Holy Spirit, and then he speaks by a demonic spirit. Get behind me, Satan. But you'll note that Jesus can tell the difference. When he hears the voice of Satan, he binds it. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And there's a lesson here for us before we consider our crosses, that when we encounter these sorts of demonic words that would, well, 
lie to you about who Jesus is and what he has done for you or where he's promised to be for you, for your faith, life, and salvation. That to fight against them, like Peter maybe tried to do, is, well, it's to fail. We cannot fight against demonic words ourselves. Instead, we commend them to God, as the prophet Jeremiah said. I'll quote it here for you. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take you, take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. The only tool that we have, if we are to be God's instrument and not an instrument of the demonic spirit, is the Word of God. To know that Word, to have it written upon our hearts, to consider it as we go about our work, to meditate upon it day, morning, noon, and night. And that Word does not come from inside of us. But it, indeed, it comes from outside us, or in, as we used to say in Latin, extra nos. The word comes from outside of us, just as it did for Peter, whichever word we speak. But we pray that the word that we'd receive would be Jesus' word, and that gift the Spirit would use then to rebuke all the false words in our own hearts, the false words spoken by our neighbors, the false words of this world that seek to lead us astray. We are given, just like Jesus did, to bind the evil foe, to use that binding key to accuse, rebuke, and curse lies and liars. But that's not the final word. And if that was the only word we'd say, then we would never take up our cross and follow Jesus. After the rebuke and the repentance worked by the Spirit through that condemning word, Jesus will loose Peter ultimately by forgiving him, not just once, not twice, but three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. So again, we can learn what it means to take up our cross by considering Jesus, who actually suffered, yes, in his body, yes, he suffered death, but those were actually a result of his speaking the truth in love, speaking it to Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, speaking it to civil rulers like Pontius Pilate, speaking it to those who would like it or like it not, as the hymn says. That's what it means to take up one's cross, is to suffer for the sake of the truth that is Jesus, for speaking the truth that is the stumbling block and the rock of offense. To speak the word that offended Peter and Satan ultimately, which was this word, that it was necessary that Jesus suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. That there is no salvation in anyone or anything other than Jesus. And not just any Jesus, but Jesus who suffered and died for your sins and rose again for your justification. That is an offense to those who would seek to save themselves like Peter or to have a different sort of salvation that comes by the doing of commands and rules. Instead, we are called to proclaim the good news of forgiveness free and unrestrained in Jesus, which offends some, but to those who would receive it, is a joy and a delight to finally, after days, weeks, years of the accusing word in their ears and on their conscience, to finally hear, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Of course, the people that end up being forgiven are often the people that are the most offensive to others, who have their share of, what shall we call them, issues. Maybe ones who don't seem to quite fit in. They don't look like us. They don't sound like us. They don't dress like us, perhaps. And yet they come desperately looking for someone finally to say to them, I forgive you your sins. And then they hear that word, and that word restores them. And now joins them to us in that word of forgiveness, in Jesus, which then makes everyone who has been joined to them an offense, right? Right? 
makes the whole congregation of offense, how could that person be forgiven? How could that person be a Christian? And that's only the beginning. As we mentioned in the sermon on Sunday, so again, you hear from our epistle today in Romans 12, that as we bear that cross, that is to suffer the sins of others and forgive them in the name of Jesus, that it changes the whole way that we relate to one another, that we don't see one another as people who need to get their life together and get their act together and do all the right things so that they can save themselves from what is surely impending doom. But instead, that we would commend them to Jesus to be forgiven. And where there is forgiveness, there Jesus also promises to work by his Spirit with life and hope and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control, chastity, and the like. But not only for them, but for us too. You heard the long list that seemed almost impossible for you to fulfill, but is Paul's description of the cruciform life, the life under the cross, abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being affectionate to one another, loving one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, rejoicing in hope, patient in every tribulation, praying for one another, distributing to the needs of the saints, showing hospitality, blessing those who persecute you, loving even your enemies, blessing them and not cursing them, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice, being of the same mind, that is the mind of Christ, not repaying evil for evil, but forgiving day after day, leaving vengeance to the Lord, who alone can exercise such vengeance. That's not easy to do, and it will make you an offense to others so much so that maybe they will want to crucify you like they crucified Jesus. But if that's what comes, so be it. That's the Lord's will. Instead, never cease to show forgiveness to others, suffering others' sins, just as Jesus suffered yours, but ultimately forgave them. May God grant us faith to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand for the offertory. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, you served your people of old through priest and Levite who of themselves could never heal the curse of the law. Give us Christ Jesus, the true priest, who with his oil and wine is able fully to heal all wounds, forgive all sins, and bring us to eternal rest. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you gave the Old Covenant through angels to train Israel in your law. Bless the ministers of your New Testament to proclaim forgiveness, life, and salvation to all nations in the stead and by the command of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O righteous Lord, by your wickedness we merit many of the evils that befall us. Nevertheless, cut short your wrath. Make room for repentance and forgive us for the sake of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O God, Father of us all, turn the hearts of Christian brother to brother and sister to sister, that those who fall into sin would be brought to repentance and not rebuked beyond measure, but rather be restored to the communion of the faithful. Lord, in your mercy. 
Holy Lord, preserve your gift of marriage against the ravages of sin, the schemes of the devil, and the raging of the world. Bless the couples and families of our congregation. Strengthen them in love and care for one another and establish them on the foundation of your word. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord and King, you appoint earthly rulers to urge the good and punish the wicked. Grant both justice and restraint in their punishments, that goodness and grace may be established in our land. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, wherever the wicked strip and wound and wherever the devil seeks our fall, you meet us with healing and grace to endure. Soothe and lift up all in need, especially those we now name in our hearts. Carry them to find rest in you. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, as Satan once overcame our first parents through the eating of the tree's fruit, so overcome him now among us by the fruit of your son's cross, his body and blood given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Bless all who commune with repentance and faith, that in the comfort of the gospel they may be cleansed and prepared for eternal life with you. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabaoth, Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, thou Lamb of God,
Lord, now let us thou thy servant be Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.